Good day. This is Speak On It. The Retro Current Team Who Edition. The Who stands for We Help Out. We Help Out is a youth core intergenerational group of the Retro Current team, which is a intergenerational task force created in 2010. But I told y'all that before, so I'm just saying a little bit here on that. But we'll be talking about some things today, but before we get off into that, I, I want to bring something to your attention. Part of the Westside Heron Opioid Task Force activities for the month of August. As many of you already know, a few years ago, State Rep. Sean Ford and some of the agencies, partners in his district created the Westside Heron Opioid Task Force. And on August the 31st, 2020, there is what they call the International Opioid Awareness Day. Now, 31st of August, International Opioid Awareness Day. Now, opioids are not just the medications. See, I have to say that because a lot of folks get sort of confused. The medications that people be prescribed and then get hooked on sometimes lead to them getting hooked on street drugs like heroin and other things mixed with fentanyl and other type of quick death solutions. And one of the things the West Side Heron Opioid Task Force does is train people, do street outreach, and all of the partners got a host of things they do. They will be participating in activities, they are participating in activities all this month, and on the 31st is what you would call the big day. Now, I suggest you call the West Side Heron Opioid Task Force at 773-230-7281, 773-230-7281. I will do this. I mean, you got to give people information. It ain't enough for me to just come here and speak on it. It ain't enough for me to tell you the retro current team is in a generational task force. It ain't enough. It ain't enough for me to tell you that T represent, teach, train. And what they really need is tame it. What they need in Chicago now, these, these creatures need to be tamed. You can't teach nobody nothing when they wild. You got to tame them. And I want to commend the Chicago Police Department because here lately they've been fighting back. They've been laying hands on them. I mean, that creature hit that police in the head with that skateboard. Boy, they look at I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't the superintendent. The, his blood stains would still be in that concrete right now. The hell of you. And he ain't no kid. Full grown, retarded fool has thrown his life away. So when I, we say teach, train, and tame. But I don't use tame publicly, but I'm using it today because of the conditions in Chicago. Until you tame these creatures, you cannot train them. And until you train them how to act like they're human, you cannot teach them. Now, I know y'all don't want to hear that because you all think everything's supposed to be politically correct. <laughs> no, that's the problem. You done elevated these, 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 these damn kids to the level of adults. You think the kids supposed to be sitting at the table with elders. Kids supposed to stay in their lane and elders supposed to stay in their lane. And that's why we call it retro, elders and back, current, those that are not yet elders, probably those 55 years and so forth, because they say you're senior citizen at 55 now. I don't know about all that. 
But whatever it is, anything in between, that's what that means. E mean educate. Yeah, some things we do a little bit of entertaining in the education to empower people. Because we know that unless you hold people's attention, you can't educate them. And unless you educate them, they will not be empowered. Yeah, it's a commentary. Deal with it or not. I not care. A, advocate. I told you before, I don't believe in that term, community activist. Get out of here. I'm out there every day, and I don't see none of you all that be all on TV running your damn mouth unless there's a crisis somewhere. I'm out there every day, not all over the city, but in, in enough of the city to say, where you at? I'm out there five hours straight standing in that hot sun or in that cold. Not only in Inglewood, but in other hot spots. But they tell me that the man, and Lopez is going to talk about it, brought this person in from L.A. or whatever, and they think that those are the people that's supposed to make some change. No, that's ridiculous. Dude called me another night talking about, why don't you just, I'm not doing nothing with what I'm doing. I'm going to watch it. I'm a senior citizen elder, and I'm going to sit here, run my mouth, and if you want to deal with it, you might get up on a little piece of information. M, mentor. Yeah, somebody told me, man, you need to start breaking it down so folks know what you're talking about. You're right. So now you know what I'm talking about. There it is. So much for that. Now, Brother Omar, what you got? Whatever you got, bring it on. I'm ready for it. Opioid use disorder. We need to be able to tell the difference between when someone is really high versus when they have actually overdosed. If someone is really high, the person may have very small pupils, they may look like they may nod out, they may scratch a lot because their skin's very itchy, they may have slurred speech, or they may seem out of it, but they'll wake up if someone yells loudly, or if they shake them lightly. You could try yelling, I'm going to give you naloxone, or I'm going to give you Narcan. Most people who are just very high will not want that because it will cause them to go into withdrawal. Finally, you could try doing a sternal rub, which is rubbing the four knuckles of one of your hands against the sternum, which is where your ribs come together in your chest. Um, you would have to do this if you were trying to see if somebody else was overdosing to try to wake them up or revive them. Uh, if someone is wearing a heavy coat or a lot of clothing over them, you could try rubbing those same four knuckles over the top of their lips, which would also cause an uncomfortable feeling and wake up the person. If the person does wake up, stay with them. Continue monitoring them, especially their breathing and their pulse. Try to keep them awake and alert. If none of those options work, then the person is actually having an overdose. So a person who has just overdosed on opioids may be unconscious and not wake up to yelling or shaking. They may be very limp in their arms and their legs. They may have pale or clammy skin. They're likely to have bluish lips or fingernails. Uh, they might not be breathing at all or be breathing very slowly. And they may be choking or making a gurgling noise. Some people call this the death rattle or the death snore. And they may have a very slow or a very faint pulse. Now, I wanted you to hear that. We did something that serious months upon a time. And people didn't seem to notice it as it relates to YouTube and other places we showed it. So I was a little hesitant about running that. And then Omar and I had the opportunity to talk to a guest that was here about a year ago. And she talked about it, that, and she said some of the same things. But I just thought since this is the month and the 31st is the day of the International Opioid Overdose Awareness, we would do that. You need to know some things. One of the things you should be aware of, I was talking to a woman yesterday, and she was telling me about somebody who was went unconscious because they had a situation and when the people brought them back alive because they thought they was going to pronounce them but they did a procedure and they came back and they came out angry as hell profanity and all this and that but then the man told them you know I was dead I saw this I saw this Ooh, woo, woo. now I'm not quite sure that the people that OD go through all of that 
But what they do is what the lady said. They be angry. You you trying to save their life. So you spray some naproxone, Narcan in their nose, and they come back. They ain't coming back smiling and hugging and kissing you. They coming back kicking and screaming and getting ready to fight. You shoot them in the arm and shoot them in the hip. There it is. So you need to be able to recognize what up, what's up, and you need to be prepared to get a little bit out of the way so you don't become a vic. It's not that they don't, they are not grateful, I don't think. It's just that once they go into that other dimension, whether you call it the afterlife or whatever you call it, that transition when they come back, you know, it seemed like they be saying, damn, I wanted to stay where I was at. But you bring them back because you, we, think they need to stay here. Some of them need to be just where they be. But LaShawn Ford said he want everybody to have as many chances to be revived as Narcan would give them. LaShawn Ford is asking that the governor and all these other politicians get together and have Narcan in every household, just like you got a fire alarm. And right along in now, because things are so bad with this pandemic of violence, of the invisible killer, as the president would say, now they say 50% of Negroes are unemployed. That's deep. So that's going to create a whole other thing. They also said that incidents of suicide among Negroes skyrocketed. We don't even talk about how other things are affecting us, alcohol and so forth. But anyhow, so much for that. All right, brother. Next. WGN investigates Cook County's growing opioid epidemic and how police find themselves on the front lines. WGN investigates Ben Bradley has the story. Opioid overdose deaths have spiked during the COVID-19 crisis on pace now to more than double from previous years. But lives are also being saved. It's a reminder that cops do more than clamp the cuffs on criminals. Every day throughout Cook County, the calls come pouring in. He's breathing, but he's, he won't wake up. Uh, I believe they both take some drugs. Reports of opioid overdoses, like this one at a motel near O'Hare. Hey, hey, man, hey. Yo, wake up, wake up. Or this one at a Ford Heights bus stop. Sir, mm -hmm. come on. I need you to sit up. What have y'all been on? What have y'all been taking? He couldn't respond. So we administered Narcan. We're going to see if we can wake them up. But when that didn't happen. Listen, I'm going to put this up your nose. I'm going to need you to inhale, OK? Come on. I need you to breathe. Come on, man. Come on. The ambulance is almost here, OK? The men in both videos survived, thanks to the officers' quick thinking and their having Narcan. Hope that person comes back right away. Because without the life-saving overdose antidote, he could have lost his life that day. Others haven't been so lucky. There have been 810 opioid overdose deaths so far this year, per Cook County records. But with hundreds of autopsies still pending, officials fear the actual number is much higher, nearly eclipsing the totals in each of the last two years. I consider it a public, public health emergency. One made even more challenging by the pandemic and the limitations it places on government agencies and social service providers. We have a total of five clients that have passed away and four have been during the pandemic. Ellie Patak Montgomery is with the Sheriff's Treatment Response Team, an outreach program launched last year that works with drug users, helping them find treatment and other services. We find a lot of people that are in this neighborhood that are suffering from addiction. Let's go, guys. Let's go. All right, let's Good go. Be safe. Our cameras were rolling back in January as the team canvassed a West Side neighborhood. You give me a call and I'm going to help you. Okay. All right. Passing out Narcan. So she came up to me and asked me, did I have Narcan? So I told her we did. And a dose of hope. Hey, we come in peace. Yeah. I don't want no trouble. We're just what trying we to get people help. Is we help people if they got any problems with substances. Due to the pandemic, the team is not working the streets meeting face to face with clients. If you call, we'll help. Making the tough road to recovery even more difficult. And hear people, you know, suffering and crying on the other end of the phone. It's not the same thing as being there and really holding their emotions for them. 
To help find new clients, the team tracks emergency calls, following up with users like the ones we showed you. Police found the man slumped over in the bathroom within inches of losing his life. We walked in the room, he had a needle in a sink. So we knew he had took, taken something. My gentleman was going through the roof. The man did not respond until he was given Narcan. There is other arms. Tell me your name, man. You're gonna be fine. Already this year, sheriff's police have responded to 70 overdoses, up from 40 during the same period last year. They've given Narcan in 28 of the cases, compared to just five times in 2019. Our officers are, are on the front lines. They're the first ones arriving on the call of an overdose. Not only on the streets, but also the political arena. In the wake of George Floyd's death, there has been a push to change how police operate, both nationally and here at home. Now we have an opportunity during one of the most unprecedented times in our nation's history to actually set a new course. With a nod to the defund police movement, Cook County Commissioner Brandon Johnson recently introduced a resolution to divert money away from the sheriff's budget and to housing, health care, and other community services. If we don't change course, we're going to continue to get what we've received so far, which has been inadequate. I had already scanned the country. The sheriff says law enforcement overall needs to change, but he says his office has already done so in so many ways. The treatment response team, just one example. I get what the defunding movement's about, but they're going about it in a way uh, that is one size fits all and not with a lot of thought. We don't just arrive with handcuffs and guns, but ultimately whenever we get to a scene, our first obligation is preserve life. Neither of the men we showed you were arrested. As for the overdoses, there are about 600 pending autopsies. The medical examiner's office says typically about 70 to 80 percent of those will be ruled opioid related, and that would bring this year's total number of opioid deaths to more than 1,200 in Cook County. And we still have more than five months to go. Ben Bradley, WGN Investigates. Now we've been trying to get this particular clip played for at least four or five weeks. But there's always been something with the technology and it wouldn't come across correct. But today was the time. This month, the International Opioid Task Force activities toward the 31st of August for the International Opioid Awareness Day. You see how much you need to know? They got bodies stacked up over there. They ain't got to them yet, but when they get to them, they already know. A whole lot of them might even be more of them than those that they putting a tag on their foot saying COVID-19. So they talking about COVID-19, but that dope is killing folk. But Narcan can save lives. So you just might want to call Westside Hiring Opioid Task Force. 773-230-7281. Now, I remember from way back in the day, you know, 19 has all 19 has always been the channel down here at Can TV. Well, a lot of people went and did such variety of shows, but 21 has always basically been an agency, information type, dissemination type opportunity. So when we get the opportunity to be here, one of the things that I will do, not only talk about the West Side Heron Opioid Task Force, uh, but other agencies and help-related services in the community because people are suffering. And they're gonna suffer even more intensely as time go on. And one of the reasons is because the fact that we have got misdirected. You got a Democratic convention going on, we're in it last night, uh, and people are hopeful and you got a situation that's in place already. 
But don't fool yourself that things going to be everything. I was talking to two different people yesterday. One man told me one of his daughters got a $30,000 loan or grant or whatever, but she had a job. But <laughs> she was able to get that business and pop it. You know, I was talking to somebody else, and they were saying that this pandemic, this violence, them folks on the street, they want it to stay just like it is because they're getting the hell of fire come up. Whole bunch of ignorant, lying parasites then got them $10,000, $20,000 grants and loans. It's the biggest hustle in ages. People are getting rich. And I say this. And those of you that don't want me to skin it, I almost told you to do, you know what I almost said. Somebody need to skin it because they gonna come back. And they are gonna go, you gonna be 40 years old and they gonna come back and you go into the penitentiary because that's federal money. I was talking to somebody else. Them $600 checks, dude drove up with a beautiful, Ram Charger truck. <laughs> he said, man, look here. I'm not working. I just got a $4,000 check. At re retro current check. Retroactive. You understand? My, my unemployment. So they getting so much money, man. And then they talking about 50% of black folks ain't working. Well, when that money run out, we'll see what happens. But that's why we need Trump to take care of some business before he get out of office. He need to come to Chicago and clean up these streets. Because these people think that, hell, I got to eat. But hell, you eating better than everybody right now and you ain't got no job. You eating good right now because you hustling. No, you ain't hustling. You ain't, that ain't hustling. You stealing from taxpayers. You don't even pay taxes. Talking about you got a damn business and somebody give you a $30,000 grant. A $30,000 loan. Get the hell out of here. And here I am, and not just me personally. I just thank God that I'm a senior citizen. I'm an elder. I ain't trying to get nothing on that level. So y'all need to know what the deal is because you do know what the deal is. This chaos, this confusion that's going on, there's people out there that want it to go on forever because they don't have to work. All they got to do is just keep it going and the government is going to subsidize. They want the pandemic to stay here forever because they don't think they're going to die. They don't mind their granddad and their grandmama dying, but hell, they want as many folks to keep dying as they can get so they'll keep coming up with them new stimulus checks. Now look at this little boy here. Here's a little creature in the car, headed somewhere. I don't even know if it's a video. But what it says is that here's a little seven-year-old boy here. Look like he done passed out because he's in the car smoking a blunt. They don't see nothing wrong with that. They think that's funny. They think that's cute. Look at him. And you think, you know, everybody's supposed to love him and feel sorry for him? It ain't his car. You know what I'm saying? I don't know whether or not he stole the blood. But the truth of the matter is, this is why LaShawn Ford put things in place, I think. Because he's out there. I see him all over the place. He's out there so he know like I know. And he see this here all the time. So he know our community need intense help. And that's why he created this other task force. The Behavioral Health Task Force over there at Bobby Wright and with HSI. Because he know that mental health and the trauma and the substance abuse are all connected. But he dealing with them with two different task forces. And that's good. All right, brother, something else. Well, right, the next piece is coming up, all right. 
Council does not have a regular meeting in August. Four aldermen say with so much that's going on, an emergency meeting is needed to talk about safety, including the discussion of the National Guard. Mayor Lightfoot accuses the aldermen of grandstanding. Two rounds of looting, civil unrest, and one of the most violent summers in years. Some aldermen have had enough. Four are calling for a special meeting. We need to have a public discussion, a discussion on record as to what we're doing for, as a city council to protect the city of Chicago. One of the discussion points is whether the Illinois National Guard should be called in for the next few months. That is something that should be discussed. It, it, you know, whether you agree with it or not, these are topics that we need to be discussing as a city. While she is personally against bringing in the National Guard, Alderman Leslie Harrison says a special meeting is needed to bring transparency to the process of finding solutions. Mayor Lightfoot, Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox, and Chief Judge Timothy Evans are invited to the meeting. Today, Lightfoot says a special meeting is not the way to get things done. I think this is a time where we need to make sure that we are working together to find common ground to address issues. This is not a time for grandstanding. Alderman Ray Lopez, who criticizes the mayor often, says this is not about grandstanding. He says it's about making sure the mayor is aware of how unsafe many Chicago residents feel in the city right now fear among everyday Chicagoans that the perception of Chicago is that we're spiraling out of control. And I don't think she has an understanding of that fact. I think that too often times she's trying to lead from a silo. The special meeting is scheduled for 10 a.m. on Friday. And while the mayor is invited legally, she does not have to attend. Well, now, you know, let's gather. I, I, I think you really we need to look at that. Anything that she don't say, she want to make it negative. She really think that the only damn thing that's worthwhile is what come out of her mouth and all those imports she done brought here. Can't she see that what she has done and the position that she's in is not working? She brought people, brought people in from other states and all of the people that's lived here, grew up here, worked here, anytime they open their mouth, she want to discredit them. She want to dismiss them. But whatever you people are doing, it ain't working. It ain't having no effect. That's because you don't know what the hell you're doing. You ain't no math. You, you, you just got in the spot. You ain't got no experience as no politician. You've been a little go-between between Daly and Romy Manning. They had all of them clowns running for mayor so they could pull this stunt and put this person in office. And because they knew Negroes weren't going to vote anyway, and they knew they had, she had at least 147,000 people from the LGBTQ community that was going to be sure that she became the mayor. So they could continue with whatever agenda they have. I said all of that. Yes, I did. Said that before the election, too. But we needed a change. But I told you then, sometimes the change you get is a heavier chain on your neck and on your feet. And right now, I can truthfully say that we're a person that don't listen to nobody. And then she wants you to hate Lopez. Lopez is going to turn out running against her, and he's going to beat her. Because he's making sense. See, can you find another piece where Lopez, well, do or not, because he basically said the same thing. You can bypass that piece. Because basically what he's saying is that, uh, no, run it, man, because he's right. On an NBC5 exclusive, a conversation with a 20-year-old man caught on camera damaging property and trying to steal money from an ATM. He confessed to his conduct and explains the series of events, he says, led him to go from an employed college student to looting. Now he's apologizing tonight for his actions. Here's Christian Farr. Feeling very remorseful very apologetic. Aaron Neal is the 20-year-old Inglewood man seen in this troubling Facebook Live video that he recorded during Chicago's most recent bout of looting. It's disturbing when you look at it, you know. Um, it's somebody who is there hitting on an ATM, saying that they're going to go someplace else and loot. What do you say to that for people who are pointing the finger at you and not happy with what you were doing in that video? Um... I'm not a looter. 
I normally don't loot. That's not what I do. Early in the morning on Monday, August 10th, Cook County prosecutors say Neal headed to downtown Chicago like so many others when widespread looting broke out for a second time this summer. Prosecutors say Neal spotted an ATM inside of a Gold Coast vestibule and on his Facebook Live video, you see him repeatedly strike the ATM with a hammer. Neal could not talk about his case specifically because he is still dealing with the court system. What do you say to those viewers who are at home? At home? Here's a young man who could be out, have a job, could have done something opposite of this. What do you say to those small business owners or business owners just in general who are impacted by your actions? What do you say? I'm sorry. I'm very remorseful because if, if I was a business owner myself, I would understand where they're coming from and their pain. Felony charges have been filed against 20-year-old Aaron L. Neal. Days after the looting, Chicago police made an example of Neal and identified him within 90 minutes of releasing his picture to the public. Neal says he eventually turned himself into police and spent a few nights in jail, which gave him time to think about what he had done. It makes you lose your mind in a way. It makes you go crazy. You can't talk to the people you normally talk to, hear voices you normally hear, do things you normally do. Like it's just, just like your whole life has changed around you being told what to do. Two youth activists reached out to Aaron and asked him to step forward and tell his story. They do not condone the looting, but they want to try to give Aaron and others like him a second chance. There should be a focus on why he did what he did and what can be done for it to not happen again. We have to tackle the root causes um, to make sure that we're investing in people, not just continuing to invest in property, jail, and punishment. Weeks before the alleged looting incident, Neal says he was laid off from his job and says he just finished his first year at Daly College, but he is not certain he will have the money to continue his education. Neil does not have a criminal record, but does not want any of these things seen as an excuse for what he did on that video. Shouldn't have happened. I regret doing it. And I shouldn't have been out there doing it. In Hyde Park, Christian Farr, NBC5 News. You know, see, see, that's game. That's game. With the that's game. And, and see, these new generations, your grandkids, them young ones there, you want them in a meeting with me. You want them at the table with me. All you people doing is enabling these, 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 these new generations. All of that's game. You can see right through it. You can hear through it. The three of them ain't now one of them old enough to know nothing that came out their mouth. But you all have made them think the other two. You done brought them to the table. But they have no street credit. They just out here declaring themselves, doing the little games they doing. And I ain't got no problem with that. But what I do have a concern about is how you take this boy who, you know, he did himself. And it's probably a federal crime because the ATM is a portable bank. It's a, it's a safe. That's in establishments of business. And if Trump is paying attention, Trump is going to probably make them use the federal laws to deal with him. I mean, this is simple. But instead of you telling the truth, politicians and agency people, tell these people the damn truth. All of that was gained. That boy was sitting there, you done heard that same line that came out of his mouth, come out a whole lot of his mouth. Last week it was that little guy that was licking that white woman's face, talking about looting was good and it was a form of reparations. Y'all enable that. But that ain't empowerment. That ain't emancipation. No, it's not. That's foolishness. The audacity to sit him there. And I ain't going to talk about what the police say. <laughs> you know, check it out for yourself. College student? <laughs> Come on now. You can be a college student. But what, what were you 
at the time that you was taking that Facebook Live piece so you could become a star and you have become a star. Here you are on major TV, sitting there running game. You got a damn administration in the city of Chicago that'll fall for that crap. <laughs> Is there anything else on the same? Or oh, we got three minutes? What we got? Let me see. I like to see that piece with, with Alvarez because West what Alvarez side, a said woman and a is nine profound. Year old are shot in broad daylight. They're the unintended victims of violence. Charlie Vigil Husky is live for us with the latest information. Charlie. Well, Mary, and this all happened around 1.15 here around Central and Lake. The police are still on the scene right now. They're picking up the tent cards that mark where the shell casings have fallen. About 10 to 15 shots were fired. This is what it looked like earlier today. Now, police tell us the mother, child, and a one-year-old in a baby stroller were walking down the street. A group of men came up in a car. Two men exited, started firing at other people on the sidewalk. But the innocent bystanders, the 20-some-year-old mother and the nine-year-old son, were struck by the bullets. The baby, we are told, fell out of the carriage. The baby was okay, only minor injuries. The mother and the child were transported to Stroger in critical condition. This is the plea made by the superintendent this afternoon. Someone knows who these suspects are. And we've seen communities in the recent weeks come forward with information to solve violent crime. And those communities were made safer once we captured and brought the violent offenders to justice. So my plea to this area, to this neighborhood, to the Austin community, if you have any information about who did this cowardly act that struck a mother and a nine-year-old young boy, please come forward. Right now, that mother and nine-year-old are recovering from their injuries at Stroger Hospital. Police do say there are a number of pod cams in the area and a number of video cameras at private businesses. They will be sorting through all of that video, trying to get a license plate number and get a better lead on the people who committed this crime. Reporting live from the Austin neighborhood, Charlie Voice, Husky, NBC5 News. But in the meantime, see, and this is what I mean. You new generations, you people that don't know. Newer tennis. You know. What? <laughs> this is this, this just a dude from the street on that level. And I ain't gonna explain that. And I sound sort of hard, maybe sort of harsh, and maybe sort of like a crank. But the truth is, Chicago is at that state of crisis. It's in that state of chaos. But Chicago don't have a, enough foresight, hindsight, and insight to do what needs to be done. When things like this happen, they should lock down the whole damn area. Lock it down, period. No movement. No movement. Because although those in the car might have got away, they got some connection in the hood. Somebody knows something. Lock it down until you get them. That's what you got to do. You got to start doing this with a metric. You got to start dealing with this. Stop talking. You talk too much. Lock down these communities like you lock down the loop. And then people will learn that it will not be tolerated. It's impossible. Almost all week, every day, there's been over 20 people shot a day. Last night by 1030, I hear some pop, 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 boom, bam. Two minutes later, there it was right behind the house. Somebody done got popped off. That's just what they do. And they know they can get away. The police ain't gonna get there on time. The way you deal with it, you gotta start treating it like it is a war zone. Don't just put the red tape up. Don't just put the yellow tape up and, and collect the damn casings. No. Tell everybody to get in the house and don't come out the house no more until we tell you to come out. And then you go down the street put them beat cops back out there on them horses with them dogs and you go up and down the street and you let people feel what those criminals are bringing to them in the form of inconvenience. You got to make the whole community understand that it's something other than pain. All they getting now is the pain. 
for the ones that's causing the pain, they've been, they just, you know, they're just out here. So if the community don't have enough sense, the colony don't have enough sense, then you got to treat the colony like it's part of the chaos. I'm gonna leave that alone. But this ain't complicated, y'all. There's a simple solution. Police, do your damn job. Bring in the National Guard. Columbus Police Superintendent defended his officers' actions at two weekend protests. David Brown says the protesters who set their sights on the Dan Ryan ended up walking through the streets instead and ended their demonstration peacefully. A later protest in the loop, though, led to 24 arrests, four on felony charges after demonstrators got into confrontations with police. This group showed up in Millennial Park with the purpose of agitating police officers and the crowd. And I want to recognize our officers for maintaining their professionalism and composure despite being pelted and assaulted with, and, and, and with projectiles on Saturday night. I stood shoulder to shoulder on the ground with the men and women in blue, witnessing the verbal abuse and dodging bottles and other street debris. One officer was even assaulted by a man wielding a skateboard. In total, Brown says 17 officers were treated for non-life-threatening injuries. In response to all of this, 15th Ward Alderman Raymond Lopez says he's had enough of the violent protests. In a recent tweet, he wrote, quote, arrest them all and be done with it. This has got to stop. And Alderman Lopez joins us live this afternoon. Alderman Lopez, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. Okay, Alderman, start off by telling us what prompted that tweet. You know, this is the continuation of what we've been seeing over the past few months where people trying to exercise their constitutional right to expression to free speech have been co-opted by individuals who are hell-bent on engaging and aggressively antagonizing our police officers as you can see in the video you're playing now those weren't protesters standing by just trying to make their speech known they were actually in purposefully going directly to the officers to confront them, to create a hostile situation in which they could later try to play the victim. And I've just had enough of this, and I think most of Chicago has as well. So Mayor Lightfoot defended the police department, largely saying the protest there was hijacked by agitators and said what happened the weekend was over fairly quickly because the police department resolved to protect the peaceful protesters. What do you think the mayor needs to be doing differently right now? Well, this is one of the few instances where I firmly believe that the mayor is correct in saying outside agitators are trying to co-opt peaceful protest. But what we've discovered is that as you look at those videos, there are individuals in that crowd who are part of our street outreach, out, outreach network, excuse me, who the mayor relies on to help us maintain calm and peaceful neighborhoods. And if they are there working to openly and aggressively antagonize the police to set this false narrative that our police are behind the attacks on black and brown people, then we need to reevaluate what exactly is going on here because our partners, the people who get money from both public and private partnerships with the city should not, I repeat, not be working against us to try and restore law and order in this city. Okay, so you said the mayor, uh, no criticism for her in this uh, latest situation, but with back-to-back uh, -back weekends where we've seen these kinds of altercations or mass looting uh, in the case of the week before, uh, what do you feel like needs to change, Alderman? Something on the, uh, the police level, perhaps the criminal justice level? Where do you see the problem now? Well, first off, I think there is one slight criticism that we can make of the mayor's office, is that we have someone who runs the... Office of Public Safety, Deputy Mayor Susan Lee, who is completely out of touch with what reality is on our streets. She is the one who authorized and authored the policy of using gangs to protect neighborhoods and more than likely overwhelmingly relies on these street outreach networks to protect uh, neighborhoods. And she has created one failed policy after the next, and I believe she needs to go. The mayor needs to fire her immediately. What we also need to focus on now is getting all of law enforcement on one unified page. Too often, organized looters and those criminals that we see trying to co-opt these events are taking advantage of the break between law enforcement, the police, the mayor, the state's attorney, and the courts. And they're seeing that there's too much sympathy and too much enabling going on at one level or the other. We need to be on the same page to protect our city. And right now, if we are not, we're going to continue to see these events unfold in the, in the future. 
All right, Alderman uh, Ray Lopez of the 15th Ward, we appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you, guys. Well, I think Lopez said it all. He make more sense than anybody down in City Hall. He really does. That's because he's from the hood. I see him all the time over there in Inglewood. He be out there. People get killed, he there. Other things happen, he there. I ain't seen, I ain't gonna even get into all that. But anyhow, until next week, Alafia, peace, and good health.